Uh, good afternoon, everyone. A very warm welcome uh, to this Author Meets Critic panel. Um, we're going to talk about uh, Isabella Weber's book. She, she's up on the screen for those that, that uh, do not know her yet. Um, uh, and the book is called How China Escaped uh, Shock Therapy, the Market Reform uh, Debate. Uh, before, yes, thank you for showing that, because of course we had hoped that there would be piles of books here, uh, but no, <laughs> uh, this is uh, exceptional time, so uh, they didn't arrive in time. So, unfortunately. But, uh, but I'm sure uh, many of you have already read it, and otherwise you can certainly order it uh, online, and look how nice <laughs> the cover looks. Um, I, uh, just a, a few practical announcements before I start introducing uh, the speakers. Um, uh, my name is Nana de Graaf. I'm uh, actually standing here instead of uh, Tobias ten Brink, who uh, was moderating this session and has organized it. Uh, he's also a co-organizer of uh, Network Q, Asian Capitalisms. Uh, but he uh, 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 fell ill also when he arrived yesterday, so he had to return back home to Frankfurt and um, unfortunately cannot make it today. I'll try to do my best to uh, moderate this session instead of him. Uh, I'm also a co-organizer of Network Q and um, if we have some time left at the very end, maybe we can also collect some ideas about how to uh, invigorate that network and, and keep it uh, alive and maybe do more than we have been doing so far, but uh, let's see. So. Um, this is Isabella uh, Weber's uh, first book, actually, uh, but it's already uh, a raving uh, success. There has been lots of debates about it and lots of attention. It's already uh, won two prizes, uh, the Joan Robinson Prize in 2021 and the 22 Best Book in Interdisciplinary Studies Award of the ISA, the International Studies uh, Association. It's a fantastic book. I would really recommend it to everyone who hasn't read it yet. A very meticulous study of uh, the intellectual debates in the 1980s in China about market reform. Uh, also a very nice chapter on, uh, a comparative chapter on, on, on the United States. I also enjoyed th uh, that a lot. Um, I won't say much more about the book because I leave that to the three speakers that we have. Um, Isabella Weber is an assistant professor of economics at the uh, University of Massachusetts, Massachusetts, I can never pronounce that properly, uh, Amherst, um, and she's also the research leader for China at the Political Economy Research Institute. Um, she has a PhD in economics from the New School uh, for Social uh, Research in New York, where we've had our SASA some years ago, uh, and she has another PhD in development studies from the University of Cambridge. She was also a visiting researcher at Tsinghua University. Um, I'm really happy to uh, be able to discuss uh, uh, the book here today and to hear the thoughts uh, of um, our three speakers today and also to get a response from Isabella and then we'll open up to the audience. Uh, we have three speakers. I'll just uh, announce all of them and because I don't, I don't have to come up and sit down and come up and sit down. Uh, the first speaker is Imogen Lui. She is a PhD scholar at in Maastricht University and uh, she's about to wrap up uh, her, her PhD. Uh, she's already been publishing extensively in the Journal of Economic Geography, Development and Change, Contemporary Politics and many more. Um, and uh, she's a member of a uh, ERC project on uh, Sovereign Wealth Funds Europe led by Adam Dixon. Uh, the second speaker, Daniela Gabor, is not here, so she will not speak, and we're really sorry. She also uh, is sick. Uh, she's at home. She couldn't come to Sasse, so very sorry to miss her. Uh, so the real second speaker will be uh, Cédric Durand. Uh, he is based at the University of Geneva. Uh, he works uh, within a tradition of Marxist and French regulationist political economy. He's written several uh, articles on the Euro crisis, on financially globalization nexus, and uh, on post-Soviet transformations. Um, and uh, he's also a member of uh, a radical online journal, Contretemps. Uh, excuse my French, it's not too good. <laughs> oh, it was excellent. Okay, I'm glad. Uh, our third speaker is uh, Gabor uh, Schering. Sh yep. uh, he is a Marie Curie Fellow at Bocconi University, uh, and um, he, his book uh, called The Retreat of Liberal Democracy, uh, published by Palgrave in 2020, also won a prize. It was won the Bassi's 2021 Book Award, uh, and this book shows how working class dislocation and business elite pol uh, polarization enables illiberalism uh, in Hungary. Uh, but he has also uh, done research on uh, 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 shocks uh, and how, um, let me see, 
the post-socialist population crisis, la 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 la, I read through your bios very quickly today, um, uh, of the uh, results of the epidemic in, in, in the US, but also the, so the post-socialist population crisis in Eastern Europe. Uh, so I think he's very well placed also to discuss uh, uh, this book from that uh, research. Uh, with that said, uh, I'm very much looking forward to this, uh, to this uh, afternoon. I uh, will give the speakers around 10 minutes, since we have a few speakers, that's fine. Uh, and after that, we'll give Isabella the chance to respond. And after that response, we will open up to the audience and I will run around with a, a microphone and make sure that you're heard, because it's also live streamed. So that's why. Now I'll leave this wonderful podium and give it to Imogen and... Um, I very much look forward to this. Yeah. Okay, that's good. Uh, yeah, so first of all, I just want to say thanks to Isabella for extending this invitation um, and also to the organizers of Network Q. Uh, for hosting this great event about this excellent book. Um, I'm going to begin my remarks uh, with somewhat of a personal anecdote. Um, so in the late 70s to the mid 80s, my father worked for the import department of the China National Technical Import and Export Corporation. Uh, this entity was established in 1952 it grew to become one of the largest importers of heavy machinery and equipment in the later years of Mao's life when China was opening up to the West again. At that time, the country was importing large amounts of heavy machinery to meet the growing demands of industrial expansion after years of economic isolationism. In the year 1979 alone, heavy machinery and electrical imports nearly tripled in volume and contributed to the running trade deficit and as is noted in the book, A Balance of Payments Crisis. So my father worked in a role in a sector that in many ways lies at the epicenter of China's economic transition. And what has resonated about Weber's book, both on a personal level and within this current historical conjuncture of monetary hegemony, rising inflation, political and environmental instability, is that any form of market transition far from being a principally macroeconomic issue, requires institutional adjustment that reflects the material and historical base of economic organization. Chapter seven meticulously unpacks how the gradualist reformers, notably Li Ning and the System Reform Institute economists, recognize in the face of rising inflation in the mid 80s that the effectiveness of macro austerity to curb rising price levels could not be achieved without reforming the microeconomic base. A wholesale big bang price liberalization would not work in the context of China's enterprise and banking system. For one, as state-owned enterprises, industrial firms had got comfortable with the soft budget constraint under the socialist planning system. Attempts to institute a hard budget constraint would shift the burden of rising prices further downstream and onto consumers, leading to market destabilization. For another, industrial firms in China had access to unlimited bank lending, which softened any attempt at creating a hard budget constraint. In short, without reforming enterprises, the industrial base would not respond to price signals. The book advocates with compelling clarity through the arguments of the gradualist reformers an essentially institutionalist solution to the problem of market transition that could, one, overcome the issue of excess aggregate demand under price control, and crucially, two, at the same time, maintain social stability and economic growth. As the book documents, the economist Li Ning, policy prescription was to corporatize and modernize state enterprises through the institution of market-based modes of corporate governance and state shareholding. Well, the company my father worked for saw this prescription borne out. The China National Technical Import and Export Corporation was consolidated under an umbrella group in 1998 under what became the primary state shareholder, the State Asset Supervision Administration Commission, or SESAC for short which now holds combined assets in excess of 3.6 trillion US dollars uh, and more than a handful of Fortune 500 companies. 
As the fate of my father's company proved, the early reform period laid the foundations for a trajectory of enterprise modernization well into the 90s, when a more progressive reform agenda took root. The value of the book should, in this sense, also be recognized as an origin story that illustrates not the divide between competing ideologies, whether monetarist versus fiscal, liberal versus statist, or shock therapy versus gradualism, but of reformists as a whole, who recognize the historical conjuncture at which the socialist economy had reached. The urban industrialization strategy under Mao had fostered an urban-rural divide, reinforced by the price scissor, so subsidized producer prices and suppressed agricultural prices, resulting in high levels of poverty in rural China. And China was largely, and, and still is to a significant extent, um, largely rural and agricultural. Uh, not to mention uh, sort of subsequent stagnant growth in, a de in the decades preceding official reform and opening up in 1978. As the book documents in chapter four, the impetus to reform the socialist planning system was not ground in an ideological shift, but economic imperative. Although this statement is misleading insofar as the economic imperative has always been overlaid by a superstructure of socialist ideology materializing the basic goals of social stability, escape from poverty that marked the majority of rural population at the time, catch up development, and transition to a prosperous socialist society. To quote then Chairman Deng Xiaoping in his selected works of 1985, <laughs> predominance of public ownership and common prosperity are the two fundamental socialist principles that we must adhere to. The aim of socialism is to make all our people prosperous not to create polarization. If our policies led to polarization, it would mean that we had failed. If a new bourgeoisie emerged, it would mean that we had strayed from the right path. This has been the bedrock of the reformist agenda and China's subsequent developmental path across the post-Mao leadership, who saw development as the end goal. Market transition and market metrics like equilibrium pricing were the means by which the final stage of socialism would be reached, but never intended as the end goal. Indeed, the book shows through the reform debates of the 1980s that the transition path forward was paved in a mosaic of policy prescriptions and beholden to any specific policy precept. Contained within its pages is an essentially pluralist messaging that the nature of state intervention in economic life does not consist of pure binaries. However, at the same time that the book is very much an origin story of China's gradual market transition, it should also be read as a memento mori marking the end of revolutionary political reform. The significance of this fact is only given cursory treatment in the book. Chapter eight describes how inflationary pressures in 1988, coupled with corruption arising from arbitrage across planned and market prices under the dual tribe price system, sparked student uprisings calling for wholesale economic and political reform. The leadership were united in their wholesale embrace of development through marketization, but they were divided on the way to deal with the protesters. Then Chairman Deng Xiaoping ultimately made the decision to bring the military on the 4th of June at Tiananmen as the book documents, Deng was opposed to liberal democratic reform. But let's be clear, it, it's a misnomer to think of his hardline approach as being in any way a juxtaposition of the leadership's progressive position on market reform. Deng's political crackdown represents the other side of the coin of a wholesale commitment to marketization. The continued reproduction of capitalist social relations has always required political intervention to mobilize the social forces required for production. Market creation has often justified political violence, whether it is the stifling of labor movements, suppression of cultural values, antithetical to exchange value, or plain military incursion, a la the rich literature on empire and imperialism going back to Lenin. Market expansion and political violence are intimately bound up in the capitalist machine. Subsequent three decades of China's development attest to this Yanis face dynamic, rendered most visible in the contemporary era by the consolidation of both industrial and political capacity under Xi Jinping. My father left China in the wake of the Tiananmen protests, returning occasionally for work and family visits. He witnessed from the outside the cataclysmic growth the country experienced in the following three decades. 
and the unprecedented levels of wealth accumulated by those daring enough to grasp the opportunities thrown up by the creation of the market. His is a bittersweet story that analogizes that of the gradual reformers who were either relegated or exiled to the dustbin of history, while liberal reformers, like former Premier Zhu Rongji and Minister of Finance Luo Jiwei, took center stage in the 90s. The book, in depth, volume, and rigor, offers a parable and an antidote for reform. Let us not forget, plural pluralism laid the foundations of China's escape from shock therapy. Good afternoon, everybody. Good afternoon, Isabella. I'm very pleased to be here and to uh, have the opportunity to discuss this book uh, that I enjoyed a lot. So I'm not a socialist of China in any way, but I'm interested in a post-socialist transition as I wrote uh, my PhD about uh, the transformation of Russia in the 90s, and I spent some years in Russia in the 90s too, and that was a very harsh story of not uh, escaping shock, shock therapy uh, at that moment. So I was very happy to, 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 to dig a little bit um, more into this comparative perspective and to go back to the debate that I was familiar with a, a couple of time ago. So why I love this book? This is the first reason. But of course, there is another reason, which is, I think, the common reason uh, why the, 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 the book received uh, so much praise. It, that's an excellent book, excellent scholarship, very well written, very lively, uh, a lot of erudition, so that's very exciting to reading the book. It, you are not annoying, uh, it's not annoying at any point, so you just enjoy reading it. But for me, there was something more. Uh, what was more uh, in, into this book was the fact that there are a lot of political stakes. This is an, uh, a book of political economy, but uh, the, this is also a book about the strategic navigation between socialism and capitalism. And how uh, deliberation is occurring, how uh, um, interests are building, how arguments are exchanged in order to navigate uh, between these two systems and what uh, is at stake here. And so that's really uh, my uh, main interest in the book and also maybe something that I would like to, to bring forward in this discussion. So I would like to first to stress what I learned from this navigation between the two systems, and maybe to raise some question about what can we learn together, what can be used maybe for today from this, this lesson. So what I learned from this navigation, it's mainly three uh, things I was not familiar with or not, uh, uh, not really uh, um, enough um, attentive to. The first is this idea of light, heavy principle of the Guanzi. That's something very elegant, very nice. This idea that in any uh, specific moment, in any particular moment in history, in any specific conjuncture, you need to make a strategic assessment of what is crucial, what is important, and what is secondary. And you need to treat that differently in terms of uh, the price mechanism, the way you intervene into that. And how can you assess what is uh, more important, what is EV and what is less EV? You need to uh, evaluate both the socio-political stakes, so to what extent people livelihood is depending on these commodities, but also, on the other hand, the productive dynamics that is related to these uh, uh, specific uh, products. So this call for a very cautious approach and very contextualized approach of price reform, price intervention, state intervention. And I think this is a very uh, interesting way to, to look at uh, policies in specific context. The second point I learned from uh, this book is the idea that you can play very hard politically while in the meantime moving beyond the planned market dichotomy. And really, I had at some point that was not only interesting, but that was very funny when uh, uh, Isabella is recalling what was occurring in the immediate uh, revolutionary, uh, post revolutionary uh, period, when uh, you had uh, Chen Yun on the one hand and, uh, and, uh, and um, Shui Mu Kao uh, on the other hand, they were uh, developing a way to intervene in uh, the market. And the idea here was the, the fact that the political leadership should not uh, just direct product distribution, but it should intervene uh, in the market. It should manipulate the market 
in favor of its own goals. Uh, so that, that was something very interesting, this idea of the uh, political leadership playing the market in order to attain his goal. There are some sentences from Israel that are really not usual to read. Uh, something like, uh, the state agencies uh, were the army in the communist warfare against capitalists and speculators. So that's, you know, and that was something very interesting because in fact what she's uh, explaining is that these state agencies were collecting tax in kind and this uh, product in kind, they were using it afterwards in order to defeat speculators and specific social forces. So I think this is very, I think very inspiring um, because th that allows you to think about the, the market being also a political tool in the political struggle. Um, the third point I, I learned from this, uh, uh, maybe just one point more here, something also that is very important, especially when you think about the current conjuncture, current debate about inflation and so on. There was this idea that by intervening in the market, also uh, political actors were able to uh, um, think uh, very deeply about the status of uh, money. Money, in fact, is nothing if it's not backed by product circulation of products. And in fact, intervening in the market was a way to be able to think about uh, the, uh, uh, what is re was really backing the use of money. And by this way, playing the market was a way to intervene in the monetary realm, why usually we think more the other, the other way around. So I think that was a very smart point. The third point is that it's more about the last period and uh, especially uh, uh, um, this idea that were already uh, touched by Imogen just before me, uh, this idea that you have a kind of dilemma of the primary stage of socialism. And I think that's very clear in the book, in this debate and so on. There was a consensus that the primary stage of socialism could not be and would not be anything more than something that will go to the dustbin of history if it's just poverty. So you need to, to uh, there was this consensus, the political consensus, to uh, deploy market forces in order to develop productive forces. And that was, of course, a rupture vis-a-vis -vis the Maoist era. <laughs> Uh, and you have very strong quotes here from uh, Zhao, uh, Zhao Jiang, for example, uh, whatever is conducive to growth is good for socialism. So that's very, no, uh, no nuance at all, something very uh, direct. So here, of course, you have this idea that you have a kind of dilemma uh, between uh, class struggle on the one hand and on the other hand, productive development with, I think what, I, uh, maybe that will be a question more, but with, uh, a very, question, a very important question at the end, what is left from socialism into that if it's just political leadership? So, and I will go back to that in one moment. So, the, the lessons, and that's my third point, the, the, the lessons that I will uh, uh, propose to discuss uh, from, uh, from this uh, very important point, in my view, uh, concerning uh, the prospect of socialism today. As a prospect of socialism in two directions, in one direction in China, and on the other hand in uh, the West, in Western uh, developed uh, uh, rich countries. So in China, I, I really don't want to make any point because I am not qualified to do that, but I just want to raise questions, and I think uh, that was already a little bit touched, but that could be clarified. Uh, could we say, uh, 30 years after uh, uh, this uh, debate, almost 40 years after this debate, that uh, Deng uh, succeeded or failed in his attempt to, um, to uh, preserve the possibility of socialism in China, in the sense that we can, uh, he, he, you have some quotes in, the, in, your, in your book, uh, Isabella, when you ex by Deng, who explained that in the mid 21st century, we will be beyond the, so the primary stage of socialism, and then the secondary stage could, could become. So, at least literally, we are not out of this possibility. It is still present uh, theoretically. However, my own uh, sensibility is that uh, the political leadership alone uh, it's not enough to, to uh, develop such uh, possibility if you do not have active social forces that support this kind of project. And in one sense, there is, this is a victoire à la pyrrhus. Uh, uh, there was the, this preservation of uh, the formal possibility of socialism, but the true uh, activity of the masses that will allow that to occur are just suppressed by this very uh, political leadership that was supposed to preserve the possibility of socialism. So I would like to, to just to raise this point and maybe uh, hear what are your feelings about that. The second point, I will be a little bit more precise, concerns so socialist strategy in the West. 
And in one way, uh, in a provocative way, we can ask what can we learn from this navigation between socialism and capitalism by the Chinese leadership in the 80s toward the possibility of navigating between capitalism and socialism, maybe in the West, uh, in uh, the decade that, that come. So I think that here three points can, uh, can be raised, the three points that I just uh, discussed uh, uh, previously. The first one is this light and heavy uh, uh, distinction. It seems to me that in the context of the ecological crisis, there is a lot of, to be learned from that. Huh? What would that mean to consider that what concerns the ecology, the environment, is a really heavy, uh, 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 the heavy part of the, the socioeconomic today. And that means that it should have a specific uh, uh, way to be dealt with in terms of economic policies and maybe uh, at, at the very minimum, stronger regulation of prices, maybe other forms of, uh, of um, coordination. Um, which uh, leads me to my second point, which is uh, this idea of gaming the market for political goals. Uh, how could, uh, so, I don't know, uh, Bernie Sanders uh, would have won the presidency in the US, or uh, whether, I don't know, uh, uh, maybe um, Tsipras in uh, Greece, no, Tsipras, he won, not Tsipras, but somebody else that would have won and would have been able to push an agenda. Uh, what could have he, how could we politically game the market for political goals today? And uh, I was thinking maybe that uh, we can think about how to defeat, for example, finance or fossil uh, capital in such a context. And of course, if you think about the inflationary context of today, that could be a nice way to, to disarm finance and to, to weaken finance. So to what extent uh, the way we will deal with inflationary pressure today could be played against specific social forces and in especially uh, finance. And finally, my third point will be about, uh, uh, there is a very striking uh, point in the, in, the, in the book, is that everybody, even, even uh, those people that were the less cautious, the more cautious about liberalization, agreed that there was a need for more market uh, incentives in order to, f uh, to favor growth in China in the 80s. So, uh, and uh, in, the, in the West, uh, in rich country in the West at least, growth is for sure not the main priority. Uh, and there are a lot of discussion about, if not degrowth, maybe beyond growth or post growth or something like that. Could we uh, consider that if the market and this kind of incentives was so important in order to foster the development of productive forces and so on, up to the point that the Chinese leadership saw no other opportunity to do that, could we think the other way around that now that growth is not an imperative or even is it, it's a problem, uh, uh, reducing the market, the place of the market, or uh, shifting to other uh, way of uh, organizing the economy could be, could be a, a way to, uh, to, to uh, think about uh, economic policy. So I think that I will end here. And thank you so much, Isabella, for these great moments of reading and thinking. Of, that was a very important book for me. Thank you. Thank you so much. Hey, thank you, uh, thank you for the invitation and, and for the opportunity to to comment on this uh, really brilliant book. Um, and I'm also very grateful that this is taking place uh, still in person. But I, of course, regret that that uh, perhaps the most important participant cannot be here, and also quite a few other people had to had to miss uh, uh, this 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 uh, this this panel. Uh, so what I thought was to, if you haven't read the book, I will try to convince you to do that by giving you three plus one reasons. If you had read it, I will just emphasize uh, uh, the, the, some of the strengths of the, of the book. And then I will have one, one question uh, to, to Isabella at the end. So um, let me start with the, uh, with, uh, with, uh, with the strengths of the, of the book, uh, the, the three substantive strengths, uh, uh, I think, uh, the first uh, is that it's although a book uh, about, of course, China, but it is embedded in this com comparative perspective. And, uh, and I think that's, that's a really great strength to, to, to do a, basically a, a history, a case study in one country, but still manage to, to, uh, to have this comparative uh, uh, agenda in the, in the background. Uh, I, I also really liked 
uh, the stories about uh, price liberalization, the post-war price liberalization story uh, in the US, how rapid the price liberalization led to uh, social unrest. Uh, contrasted to, to the British case where more gradual liberalization had uh, resulted in, uh, in, 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 le uh, in less intensive social conflicts or no social conflicts. And I also thought it was very, very important that the book uh, intervenes in this uh, debate, or not debate, but basically tries to uh, redraw the picture about the post-war the post German economic success story and this image of Ludwig Erhard as, as the architect of, of, of the economic miracle, and how the book uh, really shows that uh, rapid liberalization there uh, in the post-war years also created social conflicts, and then, in fact, uh, the German government had to step on the brakes uh, and, 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 and take back control in, in many sectors of, of the economy. So this is another part of the comparative agenda that I thought was, was really in, in, insightful and, and important uh, to have. But of course, uh, I am an Eastern European, and uh, quite a bit of my research is about the, shock therapy and its uh, adverse effects in, 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 on society and politics in Eastern Europe. Uh, and, and of course, the contrast between, uh, between China and, and, and other post-socialist countries in Eastern Europe is, is, is massive. Um, and if you think of countries like, like Ukraine or Serbia, around 2016, uh, they were still below their economic development level uh, that they reached before uh, they began to transition to market economy. During, in the, at the same time, China has been basically exploding in terms of economic growth, uh, while these countries were still like just trying to regain the same position they were at uh, before they started their economic reforms. Uh, even those countries that are usually considered sort of the success stories of the economic transformation, like the country that I'm coming from, Hungary, but other countries in East Central Europe. These are sometimes considered success stories because of foreign investment. Uh, and foreign investment helped re-industrialize these countries and generate export revenues, but this also creates all, all sorts of problems. There is huge dependency in these countries. Technology is completely uh, uh, externally owned, uh, re leading to economic dualism and social, social inequalities. And, uh, and if you look at the political developments in the region, these social and economic tensions are fueling the kind of populist backlash against liberal democracy and, and, and liberal economic policies. Urbanism in Hungary cannot be understood without the preceding 20 years of, of shock therapy reforms and, and, and liberal, uh, liberal politics. So this contrast between Eastern Europe and, and the, the completely different way uh, the Chinese reformers constructed uh, the transition to away from central planning to, to, to some form of, I don't know, that's a question to wear, but some form of, uh, some form of uh, managed capitalism is, is really um, an important contrast. The second strength of the book is, is that it's a very, uh, very convincing story about the power of ideas, I think. Uh, and it's, it's, it's important to make, make, make that kind of argument, because you can read frequently how it's basically the size of China that, that matters, and oh, they can do everything because they are so huge. But in fact, it's not. The book shows how important economic ideas and the politics behind and the personalities behind those ideas were. Uh, uh, that's, that's very important. And, uh, and it's also crucial that the book intervenes in this debate about um, you know, successful globalist neoliberalism versus inward-looking statism, as if these were the two options. But it's very clear that the most successful East Asian stories were completely about a different dichotomy. There, there, this dichotomy does not describe reality in that part of the world, and that this is gradualism or developmentalist gradualism is about reforming, is about opening up, but the real crucial question is how you manage this process. Uh, so this kind of juxtaposition between globalist neoliberalism and an inward-looking autarky is completely misleading, and, and the book really drives home this point about the importance of developmentalist gradualism. I really loved 
the historical ex examples, how the legacy of managing the market in China was, was important in, in, in informing contemporary debates uh, um, and, and informing policymaking, basically. And I also like this sort of a little bit ironic story about how these economists, these gradualist economists, uh, all coming from intellectual families and, and good, well-educated, living in the big cities, and then they get banished to the countryside. But because they have access to books, they bring those books with themselves. And through this forced stay in rural China, they basically get to know the social reality there. Uh, and and, and, and that, that's something that I really found uh, interesting as part of, you know, reality, how a gradualist idea is developed by, by engagement with social reality in, in, uh, in, in rural China and, and the deep poverty that, that prevailed in, in that part of the, of, of the country. Uh, the third substantive strength is, uh, is, even though it's, of course, a book about the strengths of ideas, but in some sense, it's also about how not to take ideas too seriously, in a sense of not being so much ideology-driven or theoretically dogmatist as neoliberal shock therapy economists are, or tend to be, or were. Uh, because the kind of economics, the, the developmentalist, gradualist economics, is very much empirically oriented and very much pragmatic, as opposed to the theoretical dogmatism of, 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 uh, of shock therapy. Um, and um, the, and this, is, this, is, this is, I think, something very important still until, uh, until today, uh, because even though economics is, is changing, uh, we cannot say that it's still the same uh, highly theoretical, neoclassical kind of economics that is dominating. Economics has underwent a, a very massive empirical revolution with all the causal inference uh, craziness going around. But it's still, uh, there's a drive towards abstraction in economics, right? The, the, there, there's huge debates about whether you should cluster your standard or it's on the highest cluster or, or, the, or the level of the treatment. Great, interesting debates, but still very abstract. And these are not about you know, getting to know really deeply reality. These are not historical methods. So there isn't, what I wanted to say is, even though economics is changing, still there is no pluralistic approach to really getting to know reality through institutionalist or, or historical uh, methods. And, and this lesson about China's success is, is also a lesson about how to do economics, how to understand economic processes through this empirically open, pragmatic approach to learning from different, uh, different disciplines, uh, which, which, are, uh, which are very, very important in informing uh, um, policymaking, or, uh, and, and very important in, in informing policymaking in, in China also. So in, in, in my review, I, I use this metaphor of, of defeating armchair economics which is something I borrowed from, from Herbert Simon, where, where armchair economics is, is basically this way of theorizing, uh, sitting in the armchair without the, 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 the need or without the desire to deeply get to know reality, which is in contrast to the, to the history of these gradualist economists who, who went there, who've been there in the countryside, they were driven by a deep desire to pragmatically understand, experiment, and come up with policies this way, instead of deriving policies from a set of very well-defined uh, 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 theoretical, th theoretical laws. So uh, uh, this, this is the, the, the third important substantive strength of the book. And my fourth point is sort of a more kind of formal, which is, which is of course, the methodology of the book, book itself. It's, it's extremely richly researched, built on a, on a very, very rich empirical foundation. And as also Cedric has pointed out, the style is really engaging. So it's, it's a pure joy reading the book. You'll get through it very quickly, even though it's, it's, it's a lot of, lot of inf inf information. So as a piece of social science scholarship, it's also a really, really, uh, 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 formally speaking, uh, very, very well, well done. So uh, finally, I have just, uh, I have two questions, but maybe I'll just uh, raise, raise one of those. Uh, so I, I mentioned that this is a book in part about the power of ideas. 
um, and 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 then the book keeps the, the focus on on the role of ideas and the politics of of, of ideas. Um, but then this raises the question about what we could call maybe the power of power of the power of structures. Um, so you know, uh, uh, one could raise the question whether uh, so how far to what extent uh, did the success or did gradualism in China rely on the fact of, of or, or, or rely on the lack of political reforms. So uh, put, to put it otherwise, if, if, uh, if, um, if, if gradualism requires the kind of, was, was driven by the desire of the Communist Party to, to stay in power, what does this tell us about the potential of politically liberalizing socialism and getting to some form of democratic socialism that has democratic co competition built in, can then, is then this possible, is, is, is a gradual kind of market, building market socialist economy still possible while liberalizing, liberalizing political processes as well. Uh, this is something that, that of course is, uh, it's not a criticism because it's a huge book and it's a different story from the watch that we, which the book addresses, maybe the second book will be, uh, will address this or maybe some other article, but uh, I would be just curious about Isabella's uh, take, take on this question. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Yeah, I think I, I, I don't know if you hear me, Isabella, but I, I give it straight to you now. Thanks so much. Um, let me start by thanking Nana for stepping in um, last minute and Tobias, even though he cannot be here for organizing this. And um, I really thank all the three of you um, for your comments. Um, when I was thinking whom to propose to be invited, I was trying to get very different perspectives on the book. And I think this has been um, uh, uh, fully achieved. And I was looking for perspectives from which I could learn something. <laughs> That's why you all came to mind. Um, and I certainly did learn a lot from your comments. So thank you very much. Um, I try to um, respond to the points that have been raised um, pretty much in the order in which um, they have been raised. This will be a bit free flow since uh, I, I just received the comments now, right? Um, so let me start um, with Imogen's comments, which I think um, are really important in kind of situating where the book sits in, in China's own um, process. And I want to pick up on the keyword that she um, provided, which is this whole idea of no hard budget constraint and the idea of the microeconomic base of the macroeconomic transformation of China's economic system, which I think is an insight that continues to be incredibly relevant in the sense that um, even now, we are once more faced with very deep transitions. We are faced with sudden shocks um, from war. We are faced with a deep shock from a pandemic. And we are faced with the big question of a transition to a greener and more climate um, change uh, compatible kind of economy. In all of these um, uh, dimensions, we are faced with the question of how can we bring together the microeconomic level of the specific institutions, specific structures of an economy with the macroeconomic outcomes, which might sound like a trivial point, <laughs> might sound like an obvious point to make, but the surprising insight is that most of the ideas of shock therapy, and in fact, most of the ideas of macroeconomics until the very day, are uh, cleanly separating these specific sectoral structures from the macroeconomic outcomes. So the question that um, Imogen has identified is one of the key questions in the book, which is how to deal with aggregate access demand in moments of transition is one that we have just been facing once more. We have faced the transition from a shutdown to a post-shutdown economy in which arguably we have had some sort of access, aggregate access demand. And the ways in which economists have tried to understand this problem has been almost purely um, macroeconomic, which has led to the idea that um, as long as we are far away from total capacity utilization, there would not be an inflationary pressure. If, on the other hand, you look at this problem from the perspective of the specific structure of the economy, from the specific structure of the position of different sectors within the economy, 
And you add the question of the lack of a hard budget constraint, which I would argue in a context of highly concentrated corporate power is an issue under capitalism as much as it was under socialism, then a shock to one important sector, um, a price shock where prices shoot up, um, which was what would have happened under Big Bang, and which is what happened in the context of the pandemic, in the context of the war um, situation that we are facing, then this kind of price shock is not being absorbed by the other sectors, but it's being handed down, which resides in an inflationary dynamic. So this is just one example to illustrate how I think the economics that was at play in China's um, reform debate um, continues to be um, incredibly relevant. In fact, I was almost shocked when I realized um, just how close the connections are. But um, more closely um, to the question of, um, of China's reforms and the question of the end of a revolutionary moment and the question of um, market creation, capitalist accumulation and political violence. I think that Imogen is putting her finger right at, the, at a key point when she's saying, let's not forget pluralism laid the foundations for China's escape. And I think that this kind of has a dual message. On the one hand, um, it has the message of there was an escape, so an even bigger catastrophe has been averted, which would have been the kind of total economic collapse um, that happened in other contexts, as, as Gabo has just laid out, which came at enormous um, human costs, not least in the form of, um, have, for example, health implications, which is a topic that Gabo has also researched in detail. So in that sense, yes, there was an escape, and that was an escape from an even greater catastrophe. But there's also kind of a nostalgic moment, and this is actually something that came out in the interviews that I have been conducting, where most of the people that I talked to were pointing out to me at some point in the interview, without my asking about it, that um, the 1980s were very different from the time when I was talking to them, and this was in 2016, 17, so not even now, this is already several years ago, but even then, um, the dictum was the 1980s was a moment of genuine openness where it was not clear where the future would take China. And as such, it was possible for people like Wang Xiaojiang, who wasn't even a party member at the time when he was discussing one of the most consequential reform um, uh, policies at the time, namely price reform, with the prime minister, that this was impossible, that someone who was not an insider, who was not from inside the system, could, um, could be consulted by the top leadership on questions of such um, enormous uh, 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 significance for China's future would be unthinkable in the context today. So in that sense, I fully agree that it is a bittersweet story. At the same time, I think that it shows us that already at this tipping point of 89, in some sense, the, 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 the window that opened in the 80s closed, um, which is why, and while at the same time, the kind of economics, as I'm arguing, that was created um, in, in, in the 80s continued. So you have this, 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 um, this parallel development of a closing political window, whereas the economic policies, the economic dynamic that is, um, is created in the 80s, I would argue, continues, which is why I would um, see the current moment that we are observing not so much as a radical and sudden break with what happened in the 90s and the 2000s, as many commentators have arguing. Oh, suddenly Xi Jinping appears on the scene and then everything is differently, appears to be differently. But rather that it, it is a, a new round in the struggle of these different forces that in many ways date back to the beginning of reform. I want to comment on the idea of light and heavy, um, since again, I think almost strangely to me, <laughs> this idea has become extremely relevant to questions that go way beyond China in the current context. During the pandemic, and again in the context of the um, looming gas shortages in Europe, um, policymakers are faced with the question, of which industries are allowed to continue to operate, which businesses are allowed to continue to be open, which is a question for which economists do not have any framework, any, um, any instruments, any theories, any measurements to provide an answer. But this idea of, light, of, of the light and heavy theory is in fact, I would argue, 
a way of trying to think about precisely this question of what is essential in an economy for the system as a whole to work, and also from the perspective of social and political um, uh, 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 relations. Which is, if you even take the basic meaning of light and happy, it is an inherently relational way of doing economics, since something can only be happy in relation to something else, which is light. Something can only be light in relation to something else, which is happy, which forces us to understand the context, which forces us to examine economic phenomena in as part of an intricate web of, um, of social and economic relations, which is something that I think is, is, is very close to the mission of an event like the SARS. More narrowly, on the question of um, inflation, that is, of course, um, related to the question of the heavy and light theory, I think there's a very basic insight that kind of struck me when I was reading this Guanzi text, which is an ancient text, which seems like a completely obvious um, point to make, which I, however, had never encountered in my economics training, um, even though I have tried to study a fairly broad range of different kinds of economic theories. Namely, this point is that the purchasing power of money depends on what kind of stuff money can buy at what kind of exchange rate, which seems entirely obvious once you think about it, but is at the same time, not at all a part of the ways in which we think about inflation, because we tend to think about inflation um, in terms of aggregate big box, big black box categories um, meeting another aggregate big black box category. However, as we can see um, unfolding in front of our eyes, just the other day there was an article in the Washington Post arguing that as um, people can no longer buy necessities, no longer can pay for food, um, gas, and rent at the same time, they are forced to make choices between these three, which means that many people end up choosing food and cars because otherwise they cannot get to work, which means that they basically lose any means of livelihood, um, which means that the number of homeless people are increasing um, by uh, uh, staggering numbers in the United States as we speak, in ways that is immediately linked to the same dynamics that we can use um, to understand inflation, which then renders inflation as not simply some sort of macroeconomic phenomenon that shows up in an index that it go up by 0 0.5, 0 0.6, or whatever, but a phenomenon that we can grasp in terms of its immediate um, implications, but also in terms of its inherently distributive an absolutely political nature. Um, okay, I should speed up. Um, in, in relationship to the question of did Deng preserve socialism for China? Um, this is probably the hardest question and one that makes me um, uh, incredibly uncomfortable. And those who have read the book carefully will have noticed that I have and broadly avoided um, to use big term um, labels such as capitalism and socialism. One interpretation of this would be to say, I have been lazy, um, <laughs> a cohort, um, avoiding what is at stake. Another interpretation, which is of course the one that I would want to um, propose, is that I have tried to challenge us to look beyond the question of classifying whole systems as either capitalism or socialism, but instead to look at how capitalist dynamics become part of the political and economic struggle. Now, at the same time, socialism, which I would argue in the Chinese context remains, if anything, a vision or a political ambition and not a reality, is part of the political and economic struggle. The question of how can we play the market, I think, um, is one that raises the question of who is we. And the, the way in which I see the current situation, I do not see any major socialist movement at the horizon. But I do think that we are faced with a very immediate danger of nationalism, where we are faced with a global market. And typically, the response of progressives is to say, well, in that case, let's bring production home, let's cut off um, supply chains, let's, let's try to 
um, let, let's try to bring things local and bring them back into our control. At least this is, this is a tendency that I observe quite intensely in the United States context. I would say that the lesson from how China escaped shock therapy is that instead of trying to come up with proposals that are based on basically redoing all of the global productive structures that we face, we should start from an analysis of the specific global productive structures and then ask ourselves how these structures, players, and power dynamics can be used towards um, progressive political goals. To give you a concrete example, if we talk about um, a transition to a greener economy, I would argue that the answer should not lie in bringing the production of solar panels home, but rather to say that it is a great advantage that solar panels have become as cheap as they have become as a result of the um, uh, building up of a industry at an enormous scale in China, and that this can give space for the United States and Europe to do things at which they are very good, namely developing more high-tech, more cutting-edge kind of um, industries and developing those industries in their local context while taking advantage of the low comparative cost of solar panels, which by now are cost competitive in relationship to fossil fuels, rather than destroying these supply chains, which would make them um, uh, uh, enormously expensive and in fact um, uh, render them probably more or less out of reach. Um, on Gabo's point, I think I have already kind of implicitly touched, touched on the first and, and, and second point. I want to pick up on um, the, the point on armchair economics. And I, I, I would like to um, basically um, translate um, what the, the economics of how China escaped shock therapy, I think, um, want to be into the current context. In the current context of the European gas shortages, it has been a situation where most economists have spent most of their time arguing about projections of what would happen if there was a total gas embargo or if there were total gas shortages. So the question was, the, at the moment, the counterfactual, how could we estimate the, the implications of this kind of shock? This, however, is happening under, in, in a context where the basic data that would be required to answer this question is not available. Namely, I would argue you would need very detailed input-output tables for the, at least the whole European Union to be able to come up with a reliable answer to this question. So at the end of the day, economists um, ended up spending a lot of time debating and getting into heated fights um, trying to solve the unknowable, namely what would be the specific result, what would be the GDP impact um, of, of a gas shortage, rather than um, using the, the uh, arguably rather um, uh, rich intellectual capacities um, to, <laughs> to move into the question of how, what can be done to prepare the economy to be ready for gas shortages, which requires an enormous knowledge of the specific institutions, political dynamics, and so on. But where I would argue that economics could provide enormously useful kinds of sources um, of knowledge in the context of the overlapping emergencies that the world is fa facing as we speak. To the question of, 90, of, of, of gradualism and whether gradualism is condi conditioned on a lack of liberal, liberalizing, I would argue that the centralized state power, on the one hand, turned out to be the, the, the thing that survived um, from the 1980s. At the same time, I would like to quote um, Imogen, um, who is saying, let's not forget Pluralism led the foundations for China's escape. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Isabella. This was uh, excellent. And thank you for the three speakers with their fantastic uh, uh, interventions. Uh, I, I learned a lot more than I learned from the book, so this was really great. Uh, I will now give the, uh, uh, the audience the opportunity to, um, yeah, to ask questions or come up with comments. Um, but I need to uh, fix this technical issue of getting the microphone to work. Um,
I can also keep talking if you want me to. <laughs> no, no, just give us some time to, to switch to the on mode. I, I, see, I see your finger here and I'm sure we get started here. So yes, please take it away. So I speak loud. Do, do you hear me? Is that better? Or maybe... I hear you loud and clear, thank you. Yes. Okay. okay. So uh, it's a factual and general question, but mainly factual. Maybe I didn't catch everything, but I think that the, the question of the hedge um, policy of compensations and of uh, coordination by the state in China must be taken in account compared to uh, Eastern Europe, even if we take European Union as the, the institution for compensation. So uh, I, I would like to, to, to know if uh, there are we have detail uh, on that and an evaluation of that because from my point of view I, I uh, come frequently in China uh, and, and I was invited in the well-known now uh, city of Wuhan as a mm. professor but seven years ago uh, there is a very important policy of uh, the compensations of different kinds in China. So uh, what, what could you say about it and what study exists about it? Sorry, I'm not entirely sure what compensation is referring to here. Compensation of what? Counterbalance, <laughs> uh, counterbalance of uh, the, the effects of the market. Because okay. uh, uh, okay. th th there are a lot of uh, spendings in infrastructure, there are a lot of uh, 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 the, the inflation of wage, uh, now uh, social protections, uh, public services, etc., etc. Yeah, thank you. Um, so I think one of the things that we sometimes don't realize is that the building up of the welfare state in China is a relatively recent phenomenon. I would in fact argue that probably the biggest and most dramatic cost of the market tra transition was that it undermined the Maoist um, institutions of welfare provisioning, in particular in the countryside, and pretty much left it without a replacement. So if you think of the barefoot doctors, if you think of the, um, of, of the local provisioning of, of, of um, education and so on, then these were all parts of the organization of rural life in China that were absolutely essential to the living standards that cannot be measured in in, in real GDP terms and so on, but that were, of course, um, characteristic of the actual lived experience of living standards in the countryside. And these, um, the, these collective um, institutions eroded very quickly since um, under the dual track pricing system, it was possible to organize um, and maintain the core um, of, of the plan in terms of rate provisioning. But um, these services that before were basically free and that relied on, um, on, on the, the providers of these um, public services being part of the collective um, did not fit into, um, into uh, th th this kind of logic of the dual track um, system. So in that sense, um, it, th there is a big gap um, between the erosion of the Maoist institutions of pro provisioning of um, social welfare, in particular in the countryside, but we have to remember that most people were living in the countryside, um, all the way to initiatives like um, the new countryside and so on that are happening now. So in many ways, this is probably one of the least successful aspects um, of the reforms from the perspective of the early reforms in an area in which China has been making a lot of progress in recent years, but is in many ways catching up um, with the mistakes um, that, that, that have been um, uh, conducted in, in the early years of reforms. And thank you. The, um, the hundreds and millions of uh, um, of migrant workers um, never really received compensations for um, the kinds of uh, uh, lives that they at the end ended up living, right? So in that sense, the question of compensation from a, from a more, um, more like so society, societal um, point of view, 
I would argue, is one where China's catch-up has in many ways relied on the cheap rural labor. And these specific people that de delivered that rural labor um, were in many ways left without um, compensation as individuals, for sure. Thank you. Your, answer quest your question answered to some extent? Yes. No, no, not really. <laughs> yes, we have. What they have to lose? Okay, we we may get. We can discuss. Yes, we can, we get back to that. Okay, I have a, I have a question here, Clara, and I have a question up there. Uh, we start with with you, and then I give you the floor. So first of all, thank you very much for organizing this, and thanks for the fantastic comments. I learned a lot without having read the book, and I have a bit more of a meta question because in your responses, Isabella, it seemed. You're also trying to use the book to critique mainstream economics. And I know you've been promoting the book across different uh, channels. And I think at SASA, most people probably agree with the assessments you have. But I'm wondering, what, like from this perspective of trying to critique mainstream economics, what do you think has worked in the things you're trying and doing? And where do you think you're just hitting a wall and it's not the right channel to promote changes in these bigger questions? Great. Yeah, that's, that's a great question. Thank you. Um, I do think that it's a critique of mainstream economics. To be quite frank, I don't see exactly who is in the room. I do th see, I think, Etienne Schneider, whom I haven't seen in, in many, many years. Um, so I, I wanted to give that quick shout out. Um, <laughs> but uh, uh, I think it's also a critique of parts of heterodox economics, which often can be just as armchair and just as detached <laughs> um, as as mainstream economics. Okay, please don't quote me on this, but in any case, I think this does happen. So in that sense, it is a critique that I think is cutting across the ideas of mainstream and heterodox. Um, I, do, I do think that the book has been surprisingly successful in reaching a very wide audience and also reaching mainstream economists in ways in which heterodox economists um, often um, do not reach <laughs> mainstream economists because I think at the end of the day, the question of what is the economics of China's rise is just so obviously relevant that whether you are a mainstream economist or heterodox economist or whatever kind of economist you are, um, it is a question that cannot not be denied in its, in, in its relevance to the discipline and to the global economy today. So I think that this is really where, where it kind of um, um, uh, had its broad, where the origin of its broad appeals um, lie. I also think that the interpretations of China's reforms and the interpretations of um, China's economic rise tended to be of two kinds. And I'm obviously very broadly um, uh, generalizing here, and I know that there's much more nuance out there, but I would say that these are the two dominant positions um, that have been articulated. We're often the neoliberals until recently, until they now say, oh, since Xi Jinping came to power, everything changed. They used to actually like to claim China's success as a success of market liberalization. So then China's success is simply a story of market liberalization, which, yes, it sits a bit awkwardly with the power of the CCP, but it sits quite comfortably with a lot of mainstream economics if we reduce the economics of China's rise to that insight. The left, on the other hand, has often argued until fairly, I mean, I know in, now it's become very fashionable to call China state capitalist, but until not so long ago, large parts of the left have been arguing that China is basically mainly becoming capitalist, and many even argue that China is becoming neoliberal. Um, if you argue that China since the 1980s has become neoliberal, then China's dramatic economic rise is the result of the rise of free markets and the rise of neoliberal economics. So ironically, at 360 degrees, um, the neoliberals and left critiques often met in their assessment of the eco economics of China's rise. So I think that by kind of bringing this big debate away from the very broad brush questions of market and capitalism versus plan and socialism back to the question of 
how to organize market transition back to the question of how have markets actually been created and thought and conceptualized and practiced in the Chinese context, the, the, the answer to the question of the economics of China's rise um, ends up being a different one. And I think that this is kind of where, um, where, where um, this intervention um, has a larger lesson for, for, for um, critiquing the ways in which we are doing economics more generally. Thank you. I'll, I'll give it over to the other side of the room now and try to, you know, if you sensibly talking to you, there he is. <laughs> yeah, hi, <clears throat> thank you so much uh, for this presentation. I really want to uh, add to, you know, how amazing the book is and how amazing it's for people who don't study China, who don't know China, to learn about China, and just more generally to learn theoretically about what you're trying to do. And I think one of the greatest contributions of your book is really as you just said, to put face to face, or sort of like on the same level, the dogmatisms, the dogmatism of the you know, uh, neoliberals, of the pro-market reformers, and the dogmatisms of the planners. Right? You have this quote by Samuelson in the conclusion about how ultimately you know, they want the same thing, and it's the same armchair dogmatism, right? And in this sense, you know, it's a you argue for a very inductive, ad hoc. Uh, you know, putting like the economists uh, who were sent to the village, putting their hands in the in the messiness of, of you know how the political economy works, and and seeing the value of one side and the other. When does it work? When does it not? And what I was wondering is more of a personal question: is you know, where does it leave you normatively? Because in, in some sense, in, in this book, uh, and and which is something the trend that I see very common in political economy today. The new uh, actor of history and the new vanguard becomes, in this sense, the bureaucrat, right? The sort of economist, the bureaucrat, the person that is, you know, knowledgeable enough to then put his hands in reality and tinker with state uh, tools that he or she may, they may have at their disposal. And so, um, again, notwithstanding really how amazing the book is, I just wanted a more personal reaction to where does it leave you normatively in understanding the evolution of, uh, you know, capitalist states, even though the word might be a bit too loaded, as, as you said. Yeah, thank you. This is a really great question. Thank you very much. Um, I would answer in two ways. One way um, that is kind of simply agreeing with your assessment that the bureaucrats are the ones that matter. And the other way um, that is kind of like trying to bring the normative back in. Where the idea is that if we open up economics into methods where it's no longer the case that you can simply design optimal paths, such as, for example, we are doing in climate economics all the time, basically the IPPC scenarios that we are all looking at in the news are based on the idea that you have an optimal target of what would have to happen um, if the economy was to go down to, um, to a 1.5 um, degree increase, right? I mean, go down as in had all the adjustments. And then you work backwards and ask yourself, what is the most cost-effective way? And you assume some sort of a representative agent that then figures out the most cost-effective way for the economy or the world as a whole to reach this. Okay, if this is the case, then the answer is, here's the most cost-effective optimal way, <laughs> and that's it, right? There's no space for discussion. There's no space for political contestation. There's no space for social struggle. This is just the optimal way that we have shown to you being the best possible way for the world as a whole. If, on the contrary, you start from the inside which is, again, a very basic insight that the future into 70 years is pretty unknowable if we take into account that technological process is pretty unpredictable. If we take into account that we are faced with um, massive structural shifts that are extremely erratic and extremely hard to forecast, then the question becomes, what can be done in the here and now? What can be the kind of mobilization that mobilizes all political and social forces towards creating the economy, which is a totally different kind of question, um, which then opens up, um, I think, a completely new 
kind of um, political possibility, which opens up an economics that can accommodate things like the Green New Deal, not because this is one step in an optimal path, but because this is part of the mobilization that we can be doing in the here and now. Okay, so this is the kind of first part of my answer saying, um, emphasizing the importance of bureaucratic decision making um, uh, as part of the ways in which transitions are organized. Um, I think uh, is can be um, combined um, with with this kind of normative approach that I just outlined. On the other hand, I think it also means um, that um, economic expertise needs to take on different kinds of roles compared to the kind of role that economic expertise is occupying in the current context, where it's not simply about being too abstract, but um, being in this mode of prediction and defining of cost-benefit optimal paths, <laughs> which um, is a very different kind of perspective from assuming <clears throat> that the market is a, a, a gigantic organization that fails all the time in certain ways and that can be steered and that can be played, which means that we need a whole different range of, of, of economic data, a whole different range of economic expertise that can even act in the moment. Let me give you an example to spell out what I mean by this. I mean, as some of you might have noticed, I became quite engaged in the current inflation debate, where one of the big questions that has emerged is the question of what is the role of corporate profits? Now, it happens to be the case that in the age of big data, um, even in the United States, which uh, uh, allegedly has one of the best statistical apparatus um, in the world, except for some proprietary, extremely expensive data, we will only be able to have sectoral level, um, fairly fine-grained national income data on profits by September 2022, looking at 2021. <laughs> okay, in other words, um, the kind of economic expertise that even economic information that is available to us um, is based on assumptions where economics only plays a role of either analyzing causally um, events in, in the past or using data that is fairly good, but that allows us to project um, path, pathways into the future without, however, actually having to, to design specific economic policy responses to major structural shifts of the kind like inflation that we are facing. So as such, this, this shift from that kind of um, deductive, model-based, um, uh, 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 causal inference-based economics to an inductive, not necessarily less quantitative kind of economics um, also opens up um, a totally different approach to economic policy making and the role of economic expertise in economic policy making on which I would not want to give up on given the enormous challenges that we are facing. Thanks, Isabella. I, I see three more hands uh, in the room, so I'll give them each the, uh, the, 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 the floor and then I'll collect all three of them and I give you um, the floor back to respond to all three. So I saw you, you and you. Uh, start with you? Yeah. Yeah, and then... Um, yeah, thank you so much for your presentation, Isabella. So um, I must admit I haven't read the book yet, but I've given plenty of very good reasons to do so uh, very soon. So my question is on whether there is a relation between the market transition in China and the high corporate debt levels that we see in many Chinese corporations today. Is that something that originated in this market transition? Is it a, um, a state strategy? And I wonder about this. Thank you so much. institution and also from your university. Uh, that's why I also attended this session. I would say uh, your study is really brilliant. Uh, you mentioned that the everything we see is about now uh, uh, economic policy in China is another wrong you know, of the beginning. So uh, the Chinese government has a new policy. They want to transfer, uh, you know, kind of overcome the middle income trap and transfer the economy to like endogenous uh, innovation driven economy. And we know to have this kind of economy, uh, you need kind of the 
you know, back in market, especially in the financial market. So basically means that you need a more dynamic market, dynamic financial, uh, financial market. But we know the market dissolves the parents, right? So how do you, uh, how does your study from the history could guide us to send the political attention right now in China between the, you know, party and the market? The market could be represented as those education, the correct now, and also Jack Ma's training tag, also other like financial uh, institution chain, you know, stuff to change. So, you know, we see this tension kind of like the similar you described uh, in your talk. So, yeah. Thank you. Yes, I, th I think it's clear, right, Isabella? Yes, yes. Uh, we have a third question. Thank you, Isabella. It was very nice to uh, listen to your talk, and um, I think that it's interesting how you, you want to an uh, analyze the market transition, but I feel that somehow it's very top-down uh, um, top um, approach, and I wonder that to what extent you see the agency of entrepreneurs, especially private enterprises, play a role in the phase of uh, market transition. Brilliant. Yes. We have three final questions here. Great, thank you. Um, my apologies for boring everybody with these inflation references, but I just think this is such a pressing issue right now. Um, I mean, projections are that the US headline inflation will be 8.8% next week. So anyways, I think this is like one of the most pressing economic um, issues right now. This is why I have tried to kind of connect China's 1980s with <laughs> whatever the messes we are in right now, um, which well, might not have been what people are looking for. So let me try to make up with some more China-specific answers here. Um, let me start from the second question and try to kind of weave in the first and the third question in, in my response. And I think that the main part of that second question is the reference um, to the tension between the party and the market. And in fact, I have a working paper which I have titled um, Dancing with Tigers, um, which I know is uh, very metaphorical and obscure, but the basic idea is to say that um, China's Communist Party and China's Communist State um, has entered a dance with the capitalist market where it has unleashed, um, in many ways created and nurtured this market, but whenever this market is becoming too powerful and it's kind of getting out of hand, it is totally willing to contain this market in ways in which it continues to be a dance with a tiger rather than being overwhelmed by that tiger. And I think that, that, that we can see this in the context, for example, of um, the real estate and Evergrande crisis, which is, of course, directly li linked to the question of corporate debt levels, where if we look back to 2021, many commentators were saying that China's Evergrande will be um, China's Lehman moment, right? I think the fundamental difference between the Evergrande moment and the Lehman moment, which ended up not being China's Lehman moment, we did not have a global financial crisis that, um, that was unleashed by um, the real estate um, sector in China, even though there are, of course, big problems in the real estate sector, but it was not a Lehman moment. Why was it not a Lehman moment? Because the Lehman moment was a moment when a bubble was bursting as a result of, of the dynamics within a very highly financialized, predominantly private market. The Evergrande moment was a moment where the Chinese state had decided that it needed to step into the real estate market in ways that basically aimed to strategically deflate what was also a very big real estate buffer. To use the metaphor that the Chinese um, policymakers were using in the context of the 1997 Asian financial crisis, when um, another big real estate bubble had been deflated in, in Guangzhou. Um, this metaphor is trying to cut the trees to save the forest. So there's a very clear agency on the part of the state 
trying to step in to take out heat of a market that clearly is inflated and is in the midst of a big bubble, to then relying on quite extraordinary economic expertise and agency, restructure these gigantic conglomerates in ways that disentangles this bubble, of course, at, at cost to all sorts of players, no doubt, but without unleashing a global financial crisis. So this then, I think, illustrates that the basic logic of um, the use of markets in the Chinese context is trying to use markets as a tool, which means that the power balance between the state and the market is constantly being recalibrated. And this is in particular the case for essential sectors. Now, what are essential sectors and what are non-essential sectors can change over time. And it's just like in the case of um, the, the light heavy um, theory, something that is highly um, contingent on social and political dynamics. So if you take the example of the private um, tutoring sector, and um, you recall that um, not too long ago, um, private tutoring was an absolutely marginal phenomenon in China, where basically some small number of the newly rich started to hire private tutors to tutor their kids to be able to um, get ahead um, in, in the national um, university entry exam. Then at that time, this was of course not a desirable phenomenon, but it was still a fairly marginal kind of phenomenon. Recently, this had developed into a gigantic multi-billion industry where basically it had become impossible for students to, to, um, to handle the national entry exam um, into universities without going through private tutoring. At this point, private tutoring was no longer some sort of a peripheral, non-essential type of activity, but it had become absolutely essential to the working of China's educational system. At that kind of point, um, you have a situation where education, which is, of course, um, a, 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 a hugely political, hugely um, uh, power-based kind of part of the organization of state and society, um, starts to become driven by basically private corporations. And at this kind of tipping point, if you want so, the tiger in the dance between the state and the tiger is starting to gain a form of power um, that goes beyond the kind of free arms um, to which um, the market is meant to be um, uh, limited. This does not mean that this always happens in perfect ways. Um, this does not mean that this is not a super dangerous enterprise. I mean, for those of you who no secret and Roy, things can go wrong and dance with tigers, right? But that's the basic logic that is at play, I would argue. This also means um, for the question of private enterprise, that I think private enterprise is very important um, to China's transition. And in fact, I would not myself read my book as saying that private enterprise does not matter. But it's not enough to create private enterprises to destroy the plan. The idea is not that by destroying the planned economy, you create impetus for private enterprise. And I think um, uh, if we look at the, at the case of Russia, for example, and the extraordinarily deep depression, which makes the Great Depression of the 1930s look like a mild little recession, um, then we see that destroying the plan and destroying the structures of um, the socialist state is not enough um, to unleash entrepreneurial initiative. So here then, from the perspective of Dancing with Tigers, tigers don't just um, emerge by themselves, but they also need to be nourished and need to be trained and need to be um, uh, 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 nurtured in certain ways, or, in the, or, or to use the language that I'm uh, uh, using in the book, um, markets need to be unleashed, need to be forced, that need to be channeled, um, and do not emerge um, uh, uh, like phoenix out of the ashes by themselves, um, in particular not um, markets that contain um, private enterprises that have competitiveness on the global market. Thank you very much. 
Thank you very much. Uh, this was really uh, brilliant. And I, I want to say that um, I'm very impressed, Isabella. You, you are ill and you're very far away, but you were incredibly sharp and very awake and, and vivid. And, and, and thank you for taking us not only back to the 80s in China, but actually to the very present and also uh, the, the future. So I think we covered many very important uh, topics and themes here and learned a lot collectively. Uh, thanks to uh, also the three speakers. A big applause. Uh, we will head off to, um, to to drinks, I think, or to a break, or some fresh Amsterdam air. And we wish you uh, a speedy recovery and hopefully see you in person very soon, or at least the next Sase. So thank you very much and um, a big applause.